Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. A uh, real pleasure to be chairing this session with my colleagues Rhiannon and Douglas. Give us a wave, Rhiannon and Douglas. Uh, we three are chairing this meeting and we've got an hour to talk about climate anxiety in young people. Uh, really important topic and great to see so many of you joining from all over the world actually. We've got our usual mix of clinicians and people who work in mental health as well as quite a few other people. Um, so yeah, do carry on introducing yourselves in the chat and I will briefly tell you what we're going to do in the next hour. So we're going to have three short conversations. We're going to talk about the three E's, experience, evidence and engagement. And we're going to start off with the voices of young people sharing their experiences of the climate crisis and how they believe it impacts on mental health, front and centre. Then we're going to have some clinicians and researchers who are going to be talking about the evidence on climate anxiety, what we know from it. And then finally, we're all going to get together in a big panel at the end where we're going to talk about engagement. So what are we going to do? as individuals, personally, professionally, publicly, politically, what do we need to do to address this issue? And please do get involved in that conversation through the chat. Um, so share what you think as we go along. We will keep an eye on the chat. So if you've got any questions or comments for our speakers, please put them in there. Um, and Elisavet, who is our chat moderator this evening, will, hi Elisavet, nice to see you, uh, will be looking at those and will be sharing those with us. And we'd also really like to see what you think right now. Matt, could you post that link into the, into the chat as well? We're going to start with a quick Menti poll. And so if you have a look in the Zoom chat, you'll see this link popping up in a second. And please click on the link and go to, there we go, go to this Menti website. So just open that up on your computer or on your phone if you'd rather, and you will see a quick survey where we're asking you a question. We're asking you how you think climate change is affecting the lives of young people around the world. And you've got three little boxes that you can type some words into there. So just a really brief response. Tell us what you think. And Matt, if you can share now, the web page with those poll results on. We'll just be able to have a look at those coming through and see what people are thinking. Uh, mild, mild panic, Andre. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so you should now see this on your computers. You should have the option now to fill in this uh, question. Um, and so do that please over the next 15 or 20 minutes and we'll come back to this at the end of the panel that Rhiannon is going to be chairing where we're going to be exploring this issue. So over to you uh, Rhiannon, tell us first of all about a bit about yourself, introduce yourself and then take us through this panel. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Rhiannon and I'm a youth advocate at the Royal College of Psychiatry and I am also helping contribute to the special issue of the ACAM journal in January. And currently I'm studying geography at the University of Oxford. Um, so today I'll be hosting the panel and what we're going to be talking about in the panel are what are the effects of climate anxiety on, on young people in particular, because young people are strongly impacted by ecological distress. So I'm really honoured to be joined today by several young people from around the world. So I'd like you guys, if possible, if you could um, come on um, screen or whatever and introduce yourselves before we get started. Hi Rihannon, I'm happy to go first. Great. Yeah, my <laughs> name is Jennifer Uchendu. I'm from Nigeria. I'm also a youth climate activist and the um, founder of an organization called Susti Vibes, where basically a youth platform in Nigeria where young people come together and take action 
on environmental protection, um, take activities like tree planting, waste management and the like. So really good to be here to share my experience on climate anxiety and um, also how it's affecting young people in Nigeria. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> should I go yeah, next? Sorry, Rana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, my name's Rana. I'm part of the um, King Foundation. I'm 25 and I am really happy to be a part of this conversation. I feel that it's um, much needed. So, yeah, I'm really excited to be here right now. So, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Kira. I'm um, a student in um, Bristol at the moment. I'm 21 and I'm also um, part of the McPin Foundation and um, yeah just really excited to be here to talk about um, young people and eco-anxiety because I think it's a really good problem which isn't really getting enough um, limelight at the moment. Hi um, I'm Yasmin. Um, I'm also part of the McPin Foundation. Um, I'm currently doing my master's at the University of Warwick and um, I guess my climate anxiety really stems from um, having family in places that are affected by climate change. So I'm excited to talk about that more. Fab. Thank you guys for introducing yourselves. And um, I'm going to start off with Kira today. Um, I'm just going to ask, like, we're going to just go through some questions and feel free if you guys want to interject and come in and give your thoughts and opinions. So Kira, I'm just going to start off with you, if that's OK. And I'll, I'm going to ask you, um, can you start by telling us what an eco-anxiety means to you? Yeah, so um, eco-anxiety to me is um, feelings of worry and like concern, like anxiousness and fear directly related to global warming and climate change. And um, I know for me personally, um, these kind of feelings have um, quite almost like physical manifestations, for example, um, like feeling very stressed, very um, panicked. And I think this is an area that especially affects young people, as we will kind of see the impact of it the most over our lifespan. And it will force us into like difficult situations and decisions, um, such as where to live, food scarcity and so on. Um, I also recognise that as I live in the UK, I am relatively lucky as I won't be um, living in the worst affected areas of the globe. Um, however, for eco-anxiety, unlike other triggers for anxiety, where um, if you tend to think through the problem logically, it seems to feel smaller and um, you can calm, calm yourself in that kind of process. Um, I personally find that thinking through issues of climate change, change makes the problem seem bigger and um, it can feel quite out of control of most individuals. So it's quite difficult to take um, direct action on in the same way um, other problems triggering anxiety are. Yeah, no, I totally empathise with that because I often feel the same way sometimes when you think about the bigger picture. Um, you often think, oh my gosh, how can I actually tackle this like full on? How can I actually do anything about it? But I think um, I think in the future, if we all collaborate and think about how this is triggering us, I think if we work together and not just worry about it as an individual problem, but think of it as a global problem and everyone has to resolve it often I think for me anyway it relieves the burden of eco distress but anyway um, I'm gonna move on to Jennifer I'm gonna ask Jennifer um, how has climate anxiety affected young people in Nigeria and how is it different from, from the global north? Thank you Radon that's a very good question um, oftentimes people would ask if climate anxiety is even an African thing or something, you know, young people in the global south have to grapple with. And I would always say that, um, you know, very early on starting Susti Vibes and having a platform for young people, we sort of already started to notice that feeling of overwhelm and that apprehension of saying, what exactly are we doing? Um, how far reaching can planting a tree in Nigeria really go in, in the large scheme of affairs where we see the news and all of the catastrophe happening? So in Nigeria, um, I feel like the more we know about the crisis, the more overwhelmed it gets. So it's almost like the knowledge and the awareness of, of the issue fuels the anxiety. And particularly for 
activists and environmentalists, what we've seen is that our experience of eco-anxiety isn't, um, isn't just because it's a spectrum, yeah? Um, eco-anxiety is a spectrum. So it could be fear, it could be anxiety, it could be overwhelm, it could be powerlessness. And in my research and comparing with the global knots, I see two distinct um, feelings that come out for us in Nigeria. There's a lot of anger for us because when you look at the climate crisis in itself, it's really an issue of injustice. It's a social injustice problem. It's rooted in exploitation and oppression. And that really can be annoying and it can make you angry. So a lot of us in the global South would, would um, relate more to anger compared to the shame and guilt that I often see with you know, counterparts in the global North. And also there's the feeling of powerlessness, the fact that, um, you know, we grew up hearing, you know, the power to the youth, youth have all the power, but we don't, we don't feel that power on our side of the globe is that there is so much we, we know should be done or can be done, um, not just on the environmental side, but even, you know, with our governments and politically. So that powerlessness often plays out also in our experience of eco-anxiety. And definitely the more we know about it, the more angrier we get. Of course, there's a flip side to it. We know it's not something to pathologize. We know that we're concerned about the problem and we can build active hope working together through community action. So that's why organizations like mine and other you know, platforms in Nigeria exist really to ensure that we continue to engage um, each other. We continue to work together as a group so that we, we just continue this marathon of, of working for climate action. So definitely um, those are the distinct um, differences I, I can immediately point out. Thank you. No, oh, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your insight. That is so valuable. And I think the audience here today, especially from, would definitely value your experiences from the global south as well in being able to put together how eco distress affects the global population and young people as a whole, because we often find that the global south is often neglected when we discuss about inequalities within mental health and, men and mental health and the climate justice. Like, my own personal experience I went to COP on the weekend and I attended COP and it was still highly frustrating for um, delegates and my organization because they were very frustrated because the UN was still tokenizing their levels of knowledge which they were giving out and their experiences and I honestly like it's so frustrating and I honestly feel your frustration because like I think we this is a global problem but the lead world leaders don't feel as if it is is they're not willing to respond to that so thank you so much for your insights fantastic now i'm going to move on to yashmin and i'm going to ask yashmin if that's okay a question um like many people living in the uk you have family far away so in your instance your family are based in bangladesh and um what effect do you think climate anxiety has on families like your your family? Um, so I think there's definitely a lot of concern and anxiety um, with families like mine who have um, who still have family members abroad, like in Bangladesh. Um, it causes a lot of anxiety for us, um, and there's already concerns about like uh, poverty. There's, there's about a quarter of Bangladeshis who are living below the poverty line, but with climate change, that makes it even worse. Um, as we know, about one in seven Bangladeshis will be displaced by 2050. Um, so that creates even more concern. And um, other things like having like my cultural background and being able to go back to Bangladesh. And if I have children in the future, I'd want them to visit Bangladesh as well. Um, but we know Bangladesh is going to be seriously affected um, with all the flooding um, that's already going on and people losing their livelihoods. Um, so it just creates a lot of anxiety for me really um, to see where, what's going to be happening to the country that my family is from and how it's going to be changing, especially um, it causes like a lot of frustration as well because Bangladesh is one of the um, countries that contributes the least to greenhouse gas emissions, but it's one of the most vulnerable 
Um, so it's kind of devastating to see that as well. Um, and the way that, I guess, people are kind of powerless in Bangladesh um, to the effects of climate change. And it just creates a lot of worry as well. Yeah, no, no, like, like, as you, like, I just feel your stress through the computer as we're talking right now. Um, it's just not fair, like, as um, J Jennifer mentioned that it's a climate, it's not an environmental crisis, it's actually a crisis of social inequality and injustice within society. And I think once world leaders and once clinicians or once people of influence, and even people like everyday adults realise that it's actually fundamentally built within social structures of society. I think we can mm. continue to move on in the future. No, thank you yeah. so much for that. And um, finally, I'm going to move on to Rana, and I'm just going to ask Rana a quick question here. And like, as many young people are questioning their life choices, for example, starting a family given the climate crisis, how has it affected your personal um, choices? Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm the type of person that likes to have a very structured life. So I want, you know, I know what I want to do at this age. And I'm at a point now where, you know, I'm thinking of starting a family. But more recently, um, there's just a lot of question marks around that with sort of the climate crisis. Um, you know, I've just recently, I've just got this, you know, a lot of anxiety surrounding it. You know, I've got this feeling of hopelessness, you know, sort of like impending doom. And whether it's worth having children um, now with all that's going on. Um, you know, I, I read a lot. I try to educate myself on this topic and a lot of it is very negative. So I do read things where it says, you know, having a child now is probably worse than, you know, CO2 emissions annually. And it really makes me think, so would having a child contribute to this? You know, would me having children, you know, make the situation worse when obviously, you know, we want to sort of tackle this problem? Um, and also at the same time, am I, I'm thinking, am I, you know, going to sacrifice my happiness over this? And um, so, yeah, it's just there's a lot of confusion anxiety you know I just feel like even if I do have kids what kind of world are they going to grow up in and you know it's just that like you know my grandkids my great grandkids so there's just a lot to think about and you know sometimes when I just think about all of this it just I just go in in a loop basically you know um I feel like there's no way out and um but yeah so it is very um anxiety provoking and I still don't have any answers to be fair so yeah that that's what goes on in my head no, no, I, I am um, actually, I've also like a lot of, I think a lot of people on this panel have probably at least had this run through our minds at least once or twice about like, what are we going to do in our future? Should we take up a career in environmental activism to be able to combat um, not just environmental activism, but in a soul to combat social inequality as well as environmental justice. That's definitely running through my mind at the moment now, making decisions for the future in terms of career choices. And I totally get where you're coming from in terms of wanting to have children, try, trying to decide what you want to do with your future, because it's so limiting not knowing like how, um, where, where are we gonna go next? Because world leaders only seem to be thinking about the economy for next year or the fiscal budget, the economic budget for next year, or the political plan for the next political summit in four years time. It's never, never discussions about 20 years time, even like now in terms of the Glasgow um, COP summit, like in terms of discussing about 2030, like they've only mentioned 2030, I think about five times when I was there. There was like it was just very focused towards next year not considering future impacts and I think that's what perpetuates young people's feelings and emotions so yeah no thank you so much panelists um for contributing to um to contributing and I'm going to hand over to Andre thanks Rhiannon yeah great stuff everyone um we're going to be hearing more from you all later I'm sure there is an irony here isn't there that the people who are so passionate about making a difference and addressing this issue are the ones that are probably the most affected in terms of their mental well-being by it. Um, we certainly need to do a lot to support each other. And I think your point, Rhiannon, about working together on this is really key. Um, so let's have a quick look at what everybody in the webinar thinks about the impact of this climate crisis. Matt, can you share your screen again and see what the 
uh, survey results are. Okay, so that's very hard to read, but I can read it out. I think we're seeing things like anxiety, hopelessness, worry, voices not heard, fears for the future. Yeah, so lots of fear and anger and worry and anxiety. So I think that's really echoing the, uh, the points that were being made already by people on the panel. Um, good to see that confirmed. Thank you everyone for filling that in. There's another survey that we're going to come to later, but if you haven't filled that survey in yet, then please do follow the link in the chat and get your comments in there. So now it's time to move on to the evidence discussion that Douglas is going to be chairing. So over to you, Douglas, for the next 20 minutes or so. Thank you very much, Andre, and I would, I would like to extend a particular thanks to the participants we've just heard for, from. Uh, this is straight from the from the horse's mouth when we're thinking about climate anxiety. I'm just going to move on now just to give a very quick overview of um, some of the evidence in climate change and how it affects anxiety. Um, I, I started this off by thinking, well, there's a huge amount of material out there. There's a lot of evidence. Uh, that needs to be sifted through. So the way I went about this was just to do a quick quick and dirty search, you might call it. Uh, I used open access resources such as uh, PubMed and uh, Google Scholar, which is a very useful tool for this kind of thing. It gets around the fact that I'm not allowed access to all these databases because I'm only a taxpayer. Um, and as I said, I was focusing on reviews that have already been done rather than individual studies. And we're going to hear a little bit later uh, uh, about what uh, uh, primary research is, uh, is telling us in this area. So the first thing to say is just to underline what probably you already know, that climate change has a significant multifaceted impact on mental health. And a lot of the literature draws distinctions between direct impacts and indirect impacts. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence that's been done looking at the effects of specific climate events, such as drought, storms, etc. Uh, and the evidence really is quite clear about the very severe impact on mental health of experiencing these events. Uh, one study was estimating the, the prevalence uh, of, of Physical, uh, physical injury compared to mental distress is 40 to 1. So there's like 40 cases of mental distress for every physical injury associated with a climate event. People who already have or are susceptible to mental distress are particularly vulnerable. Um, and as are indigenous populations, poorer countries and children and young people. The other thing to say is that these direct effects are often long lasting and highly disruptive. In spite of this, a lot of the stuff I was looking at did not mention mental health much or indeed at all. So I think there's still a bit of work for, for researchers to do to make sure that mental health priorities are reflected in these kinds of study. When I'm moving on to thinking about the indirect impact of climate change. I very much would like to draw a line under the, the question that's been raised by Jennifer uh, about uh, the, the injustice, the crime that's been committed. This map, probably quite familiar to you, it shows you who does all the carbon dioxide emitting. And as you can see, it's the Global North. The second UNICEF map looks at where children and young people are most likely to be impacted. And that's the global south. So the people who are living with the, with the results of climate change are not the ones who've caused the problem. Now we bring our children up to be moral people. We ask them to think about others, not to harm others. But then they grow up, they look at this and they think, wait a minute, that's just all a big lie. So it's hardly surprising that this situation engenders eco-anxiety. You might call this moral, moral dissonance. It's entirely a predictable outcome and a lot of the studies that have looked at it talk about eco-anxiety and frame it in this way as a sort of potentially adaptive response to that dissonant situation. 
And of course, the same things are true. Existing susceptibilities are going to be exacerbated by this source of anxiety. We don't have good estimates yet of the exact prevalence of such anxieties, partly because it's hard to define and measure. We'll look at that again in a minute. Um, however, a recent scoping review of how mental health professionals approach eco-anxiety emphasised the importance of meaning-focused coping. So activities that address the content of anxieties directly through relevant strategies and activities. Bowden's review provides a lot more detail, which would be of particular interest to CAMS professionals. If there is good news, it's that it's not all bad news. There is some evidence to show that we can improve mental health and tackle climate issues at the same time. Although comparative and longitudinal studies are lacking and systematic reviews very difficult, it looks like there are win-wins here. Responses to the direct climate impacts depend on local networks and systems. So if, if we invest in those systems, we will improve resilience and reduce the impact. Furthermore, individuals experiencing eco-anxiety may benefit from involvement in relevant activities, further increasing, hopefully, the, pr the pressure on others to act. By listening and amplifying their voices, we may make a change. So obviously the answer here is fix the climate. But even if we do everything right at COP26, we're still going to have this, these problems going forward. So we need to invest in networks which at that cost, that money that we spend now is likely to be paid back in what we prevent in, in the future. So economically, as long as we do the sums right, it should make sense to, to, for developed countries to invest in less developed uh, countries to, to, to build up the resilience of their systems. One of the problems we have here is that mental health outcomes are not represented in the types of calculations that investment banks and governments make. They've, the short termism has caused this problem and they're still stuck in the short term way of thinking. So we need to ensure the impacts of climate change and the benefits of taking action are properly represented in these sorts of analysis. Many of the reviews that I found cautioned against pathologizing eco-anxiety and that's, those are the sorts of concerns I'm sure professionals will be attuned to. However, mental health priorities, I feel, have suffered somewhat due to the fragmented nature of the, the research in this area. Just to say a little bit about that, we, we very often uh, publish our research in a journal and, in a, and it gets indexed in a database. And then if somebody else from a different discipline is searching, they might not think to search the database that our research is published in. Many of the, the reviews are what you might call gray literature. So they're, they're, they're not actually published in a journal and they're not indexed in, in a conventional database. So there's a challenge for people like me to figure out how best to find this stuff and how to, uh, how to combine it so we have more powerful evidence to influence action. So there's a lot to be done and we all need to, need to think about this. Um, I, uh, just before I hand on uh, to, to Lily, I just wanted to present this very quick analysis that was done by uh, uh, Lawrence et al. in the report, which I'll include in my bibliography. And they did a quick search of PubMed, which is a medical database, and the New York Times, which you know was a newspaper, uh, to see what's the overlap between climate change and mental health. And the answer was very little. So for a more nuanced view and to think more from the, the pr professional's perspective uh, of, of how we address these issues, uh, I'm going to hand over to Lilia Benoit and she's going to talk about her research uh, into uh, how young people's perceptions of climate anxiety are, uh, are represented in the literature and the response of adults to, to dealing with that anxiety. Thank you so much, Douglas. Um, so, and thank you for having me. 
uh, in this panel. So I'm Lilia Benoit. I'm a child adolescent psychiatrist. So I'm from France and Brazil, and I worked and studied in Paris. And now I'm, I'm working at Yale University for my research project. So the project focuses on a co-anxiety among children and adolescents from six years old to 18 years old, because it's, it's more difficult to ask them how they feel just using a survey because they are too young. So we, we want to interview them to know more about what they think. So we are interviewing children and adolescents in, in France, in the US and in Brazil to know more about their emotions and, and their climate actions. So we are very interested in how can we support the actions of the youngest one. So before talking about maybe the results, like some of the results of the study, I just want to, to state very clearly something, is that actually the, the problem, just as Rayanan said and Jennifer said, is a societal one. And we know that uh, societal oppression, that social oppression and repeated trauma and adversity can lead to real mental health issues. So it's not because uh, you have a mental health issue that you have to look for individual causes, for genetics, for medication. No, if you are part of a minority and this minority is being oppressed, then it's just, I mean, it's just normal, legitimate that you will feel bad. So in this sense, uh, the global source, South is a minority. But we also have studies, even in the U.S., uh, that shows that minorities in the U.S. Uh, are more eco-anxious than others. So women are more anxious, low-income people are more anxious, um, African-Americans, other colored people, Latinx, are more anxious. And in this sense, all those persons are part of minorities, of oppressed people. And the reasons they are, they are oppressed, I mean, the reason they are anxious is that they know that they will be left behind, uh, that they are not taken into account, that they are not listened to. And so my understanding of the young generation, young people, is that they are also a minority, just like women, just like um, people of color. Uh, so what do we have to do when we have a social problem, societal problem that causes us to feel bad? So the answer is not medication, it's not uh, individual therapy. I mean, it can help, but the real answer is societal. It's just action, collective actions, like let's get together and don't wait to be listened because they don't want to listen. So let's take action and show that we are there and that we have power. So I think I have, as a psychiatrist, I have to remind this because psychiatrists usually say, oh, let's go talk to someone, let's take medication. No, 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 this is a societal problem. So we have to take action together. And so we showed in a recent study uh, with my colleagues also that collective action are a good buffer uh, for anxiety. It means that if you are anxious and you engage in collective action, then you start feeling better. And this is what people know. This is what racially, racialized people know in the US. This is what women know in a lot of countries. This is what low income people know. We have to fight together. There is no other option. Uh, so that's being reminded. Um, just a few things about um, about what we found about uh, children and how to talk about, about eco-anxiety with them. It's just that they are exposed to climate change at school or through social media. So they will have questions and we will have to answer to them. So maybe later on, I, I explain to you how to answer to them if you want. Thank you, Lilia, that was brilliant. Uh, and I'll just remind, folk that uh, in the sidebar we've got links to your podcast where you talk about your research uh, in a little bit more depth but I'm sure uh, there may be a lot of parents on who would be interested to to hear uh, and again it goes back to the thing it, this disrupts the relationship between parents and and children and uh, I have children who are saying you know what's what's my future 
and um, uh, quite right. Uh, so there isn't anything more fundamental a social structure than, than that relationship. Uh, and I, I, this is one of the reasons why I feel we need to be banging on about these, these outcomes because that's going to rattle on down, down the future and it's going to be uh, as, uh, probably as, possibly as harmful as climate change itself if we lose that trust. So uh, thank you. I'm going to hand over now very quickly to, uh, very pleased to have uh, Dr. Lisa Van Susteren, uh, who's a general and forensic psychiatrist from Washington, uh, a co-founder of the Climate Psychiatry Alliance. Uh, and Lisa is going to uh, take us up, take us up a level. We've heard about individuals, and now we're going to, we're, we're going to uh, take, a uh, uh, take ourselves up a level in terms of, uh, of action. Uh, Lisa, uh, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm really, really very happy to be here with all of you. So we have known the kids were suffering and we now have the numbers to wave around the air for people who couldn't imagine that young people would be upset hearing that their house was burning down and they may, might not survive. A global survey of 10,000 young people was released last month showing that climate anxiety is pervasive. Three quarters of those surveyed said they were deeply anxious about the future. Half of them report that it affects their daily lives and 60% say government leaders are at fault. We stand on firm ground, firm scientific ground with those who have been warning since Savante Arrhenius first talked about greenhouse gases over a hundred years ago. Building on the testimony of Dr. James Hansen in the US Congress nearly 35 years ago, and indeed in kinship with the admissions of Exxon geologists themselves in the early 70s, who said that climate change and specifically burning greenhouse gases could take us down. We know we are in trouble, what to do? Making the case for what climate disruption is doing to our children is as persuasive a case as we shall ever see. It is the moral ground that can be ceded to no one. And we have the data. We have the statements, the declarations, the pleas, the protests, children flooding the streets from Glasgow and beyond, telling us they are angry, in despair, and afraid. We have everything we need to know about what trauma does to kids already. Studies on ACEs, advanced or adverse childhood experiences, tell us. And with extreme weather events, our children are surrounded by climate adversity. We know that trauma exacts a psychological toll that can include not only the after effects of the physical harms, the losses, injuries, displacements, but also direct psychological damage, PTSD, depression, anxiety, substance abuse. We know of the cognitive effects, the problems with impulse control, concentration, judgment, and that these harms are not only enduring, which we've heard, they prime for future stress. Compounding the existing psychosocial threat through transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, trauma today can trigger our DNA to turn on a stress response that not only affects us, but can be passed in the on position to future generations. Many children suffer from pre-traumatic stress with the same symptoms as classic PTSD, but arising from images of future trauma they can't get out of their heads. Do you know someone struggling with infertility? Sperm counts in American, Australian, and European men have plummeted by more than 50% in the last 50 years. Researchers link it in part to rising temperatures. We already have surging deaths of despair. And while the factors are complex, believing you may not have a future and knowing how contagious behaviors can be, how could we not worry about the ever-increasing numbers? Deep-seated fears lead to existential questions about the survival, not only of other species, 
but about the survival of humans. And if we do survive, what will the world look like? Who will rule? Democracy is not a default form of government. Will another form of government be embraced and adopted because it fights climate change more effectively? Under what form of government will our children live? As a former CIA psychological profiler of world leaders, I fear for our democratic way of life. When people are afraid, we see a rise in authoritarian government because people turn to what they perceive as strong leaders to protect them and may be willing to give up their cherished values in exchange for the promise of perceived security. The kids know they are being abandoned. They know government leaders are betraying them. How can we explain this intergenerational aggression? Is it the ultimate narcissistic blow to be dead when they are alive? We would have no trouble identifying the aggression of rich parents who left their estate in disarray to their children who have a history of conflict. Is it worth analyzing this? Is it worth reminding lawmakers of how child abuse is defined? Not only as physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, but also as the failure to provide an environment in which a child can thrive. Given the magnitude of the losses and their relentless expansion, despite all that we know, our children will soon give in action on climate, the name it calls for. I'm sorry to say this. We call out state-sponsored terrorism, how is inaction on climate, not state-sponsored child abuse? In other news, before turning to the section on what we can do, I will offer this. Once we stop increasing CO2 in the atmosphere, reaching net zero, climate scientist Michael Mann says temperatures will stop going up in as little as three to five years. And do you know, that in a single hour, enough solar energy reaches our earth to meet our needs for a whole year. And that wind provides 40 times what we need. We have a big job to do. And the most important one we will ever have probably, because we now must be working to change the course of history collectively towards survival. Brilliant, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if we've got a, time for a couple of quick questions um, through from the from the sidebar. We had a question about uh, uh, about pathologizing, which which uh, uh, Andre has answered in the sidebar. But I wanted to ask this question about uh, there's a concern that we might be treating young people all as a kind of homogenous unit here. It, whereas age ranges that professionals might see would be in a very wide range. So is, is there anything um, you can say about the different perceptions and anxieties children might have at different stages of development? That yes. would be a quick, sorry. Maybe I, I can, don't. yeah, I can answer to this question. Uh, so what we saw in our study is that children are more sad than adolescents. And they're very sad because they are sad about animals dying. They, they just understand very concrete things like animals. Uh, but then they want to do something, which is very interesting with children is that they have also a lot of hope. So they are very willing to help as soon as there is an action to do, an activity, a solution. So I think it's an advice to give to parents or teachers is that whenever they are engaged in a project, something to do, they are really happy and they want to help. For adolescents, uh, we see the anger. Jennifer was talking about anger. So it's, again, the anger of not being listened to, of the indifference of governments. And uh, they also want to take the initiative. So they want to be followed, like to have an idea and we follow them, but we also support them, not just to say, oh, that's very good. So you are going to fix it, then fix it alone, uh, but really give them the means to, to manage to do what they want to do. Uh, so those are very different uh, things between children and adolescents. And maybe the last things about children also is that parents, more and more parents, uh, are a little bit reluctant to 
talk about climate change with their children because they are afraid that the children are going to have nightmares or be anxious. So what we see is that when the parents do not explain uh, their interest in climate change, even if they do climate actions, like, I don't know, turn off the lights, uh, stop eating meat, all those kind of things, the children don't understand the context. Uh, so they, they model, uh, the parents model something, and, and the children repeat it, but they don't know if their parents are interested in the environment. So they grow up as adolescents wondering if they are really alone uh, with the problem of climate change or if there are some adults around uh, being also concerned. So I think it's a good thing to say to parents is that we have to talk about the topic. The, the children will not bring it up on their own, but they want to know that the parents are concerned and that the parents are doing their part and that as a family, they can do their part together. And then they really feel relieved. Actually, the anxiety comes from the indifference and the feeling of being alone. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so, danger of running over. We better pan, pan on to the next session, but keep your questions coming and we'll do everything we can either to answer them uh, offline or to feed them into our next session. Wonderful. Thank you, Lelia and Lisa and Douglas. That was really interesting. And yeah, we started really talking about what we're going to do which is great because that leads us on very nicely to Rhiannon and her final panel. We hope we've got enough time for everybody who has speak, spoken so far to have at least a minute or two to speak again before the end. So yeah, over to you Rhiannon to take us through this engagement. What can we do personally? What do we need organisations to do? What do we need governments to do to address this issue? Um, thank you, Andre, um, for introducing the final panel. So we're going to be talking about what Andre's just mentioned about personal and professional and public action, which needs to be taken within our community. So, Leila, what would you consider um, good action for mental health clinicians to undertake to help young people with climate anxiety when they come and see them? Yes, yeah, so there are more and more uh, young people people coming to see a psychiatrist, psychologist um, about um, eco-anxiety. So first, I think, listen to their concern and don't pathologize it. Don't start saying, oh, this kid is anyway anxious and he's anxious about climate. But if it was not climate, it would be something else. You know, sometimes we, we can have this tendency as mental health care provider to find easy answer. So no, the answer is not easy. The answer is a real concern about climate change. Then what we can do is that um, we can, there is a lot of power in positive narratives about what can be done about uh, climate change. Um, climate anxiety is a way of talking about death anxiety, about responsibility and freedom also, the, the things I do have an impact. So it's a good way to talk about this all and to empower the young people to know that they, they can change something, they can take action and that their worries are legitimate ones. No, thank you for such invaluable advice. I hope like clinicians who've not really done much work around this or have seen patients really benefit from um, Ayla's advice because as young people going into healthcare settings, we really do depend upon clinicians knowing and how to treat and how to support us the best way you can. So I'm gonna move on to Lisa and I'm gonna ask um, if that's okay, Lisa, I'm just gonna ask you a quick question on um, what can mental health, what can, um, professionals do and what can, to support young people's mental health and climate change surrounding climate and eco distress. So I'll try not to repeat what others have already said and segue instead to the call to arms, the call to action. Mental health professionals, um, for some curious reason, have largely left the power of their expertise on the table when it comes to addressing climate. The interesting thing is that this is what we do uniquely. We get science, uh, we get denial, we get how to burrow under people's defenses. Uh, we get how people don't wanna talk about stuff for a whole variety of reasons. We know how to get people to trust us. We know how to make the point that you need to change your behavior today 
in order to make sure that people are safe either now, today, or down the road. But we have been on the sidelines. This has to change. We have to find a way to get out of our offices, the, the typical sort of academic institutions where we find ourselves, and we have to get out into that open arena. Now, it's not comfortable for all of us. I go back and forth on wanting to be in a public domain, but this is now our responsibility. We don't know why we are here. There's so much we don't know about the world. But one thing that we do know is that we can be effective. We do know how to bring people together. When we talk in a public forum, people listen. They know that we have the credibility and the background. We need to address policymakers. We certainly need to address our colleagues. And we need to direct all of this into addressing the moral ground, which is that this is the future of children who will be at the tip of the spear. And because of this, it is imperative for us to act. So one other thing, go to your professional organization, make sure that they're devoting money to addressing this. If you work on a clinic or a hospital, make sure that cafeteria has low carbon food and make sure they got a vegetable garden on the roof. If there's enough room left over when they've put their solar panels up, make sure that there isn't grass around that building, that they have wild plants and point out rival institutions that are doing this. There's so much we can do. No, no, thank you so much for that, because often the logical things people don't actually think about, like actually things which aren't related to clinical practice, for example, often get neglected. So please, 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 when you think about it, don't get overwhelmed. It is like the simple things to start off with. It is very simple to start introducing climate action into your clinical practice. And if you're a teacher, introducing it into educational settings, it's, it's a very easy thing to do. So I'm going to open out the floor now to everybody else who's on the panel. Um, what, what do people fundamentally think and feel about what can be done to address eco-distress as a, and the ecological crisis as a whole? Well, I'm going to just break the ice then because it's been said already. If you want to solve climate anxiety, fix the cause. If kids and the rest of the world know we're working on the problem, that anxiety goes down. We know that, that when we confront a problem and start unpacking it and fixing it, that our anxiety goes down. That's where uh, I think it was, I, I, I don't know who it was who said it, but it's been said multiple times. Fix the cause, it'll take care of the symptoms. No, oh, that's great. That's awesome. Thank you. Douglas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my one thing would be in order to do that, we need to get organisations, uh, you know, we, we devolve many of the responsibilities upwards for these things. So it becomes the organisations at banks, it's politicians, it's organisations. And um, these organisations make decisions in a very weird way. Uh, and some of them are just unable to respond to this actual crisis that's happening now because of the way they frame their discussions. So we need to make sure that these concerns are front and centre of all of the decision making and the planning and the investment and all of this stuff that we don't see. This is, we might live in a democracy, but you know, our dose of democracy is whatever 16 X is in a box or something like that over our lifetime. So that stuff needs to be transparent and needs to be uh, informed by a lot of the very good work that's going on in various places as to how we represent these in the, dis in the way that organizations make decisions. And that means investment as well, you know, because I think what, if they're able to perceive the problem in the right way, the action will follow. No, fab. Thank you very much, Douglas, Thank for your you. opinion. Um, is anyone else wanting to contribute um, in terms of like young people or clinicians or anybody else? Yeah, no, I would like to say I agree with what you said, Rhiannon, about it's the simple things. And I think just starting off 
you know, and especially, you know, talking about climate issues in education settings would be really helpful. I wish I was educated on this when I was younger, you know, primary school, secondary school. Um, what I notice is we always tend to talk about these things when, when there's an event such as, you know, an extreme weather condition or, you know, an event happening around the world. Um, and what happens is that's when we start talking about it. it should be something we talk about on a daily basis. And how can we incorporate these things into our lifestyles? Um, you know, speaking on behalf of myself, um, I tend to, you know, when I hear these things, I tend to sort of, you know, you know, I'm like, you know, recycle a bit more and then suddenly that dies down and I'm back to my, you know, old self. But if we incorporate this into our lifestyle every day, I think we could, it's the little things, like you said, it would make a big change. Fab, thank you. Thank you very much, Rana, for your contribution. Uh, anybody else, just one final comment before we end up? I'd really on, like Jennifer. to thank Jennifer for <laughs> doing a lot of this work already. Share, share what you've been doing, Jennifer. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, Andre. I mean, I just wanted to say that for the for the longest five six years, doing work with young people in Nigeria, because it wasn't you know technology or something so big, it wasn't recognized. The fact that we're trying to drive community action, we were saying that young people need to be empowered to be able to lead and even imagine the future that they, they they wanted to live in and not until recently has this you know action of radical hope and wanting to really go back to the structures and the societal um, structures that make um, climate change even possible um, only recently has it been prioritized and that's why it's really important that's why conversations like this are important to say you know, a lot of community action, individual actions, really important. And um, for us, is really thinking about how do we live with climate change? Because it's already here. Um, we don't see it anymore as trying to prevent some future. The future is here already. We're already seeing the disasters. We're already living with flooding and whatnot back home in Nigeria. And really going back to checking our emotional response and where our minds are with everything that's happening is really important. So work like this really needs to be invested in and supported as much as possible. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Your experience is actually invaluable to this panel. And I think to many of the attendees who have um, come to the webinar today because People want not just experiences from a psychiatric perspective, but a social perspective as well, and how to implement that within their own communities and backgrounds. So I'm going to pass on to Andre to finish up the um, webinar. Great stuff. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We've had a really brilliant, rich discussion in the chat. So thank you to everyone who's contributed to that. We'll save that and we'll share that with all the other webinar materials with you on the website. Find out more about becoming an ACAM member and to be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.